It had been one of those jolly old-fashioned Christmas dances where nearly everybody stays the night. There were three of us sharing a room, and in our surroundings of bright chintz, candle flame, and firelight, we had talked of ghosts. Well, we none of us actually believed in ghosts, of course, but my heart at least seemed to leap to my throat and choke me there when a tap came to our door. A tap faint, not to be mistaken. Who's there? I asked, somewhat hesitantly. I give you my word: the instant of suspense that followed is still reckoned among my life's least confident moments. Almost at once, the door opened fully, and Miss Eastwich, my aunt's housekeeper, companion, and general standby, looked in on us. She shivered a little. <laughs> so did we. For in those days, corridors were not warmed by hot water pipes, and the air from the door was keen. I saw your light, she said at last, and I wondered how she is. Her glance turned towards the door of the dressing room. Another girl, who had fainted suddenly during the dance, had been put to bed there. She's fast asleep, I said. I should have added a good night. But the other two, who were both younger than me, were already on their feet. Come in! The younger of them cried. Yes, come in! Echoed the other. Come in and get warm. There's lots of cocoa left. They drew Miss Eastwich in and shut the door. We've been telling ghost stories, I explained. The worst of it is, we don't believe in ghosts. No one we know has ever seen one. All ghost stories are so beautifully rounded off," said Miss Eastwich. "The most torrid ghost story I ever heard was one that was quite silly." The other two squealed with delight. "Tell it! Oh, do tell it!" "I can't. There's really nothing to tell," Miss Eastwich said slowly. "In fact, the only thing that I ever knew of was was hearsay." She paused. Till just the end. I knew then that she would tell her story, and I knew too that she had never told it before, that she was only telling it now because she was proud, and this seemed the only way to pay for the fire and the cocoa and the company. Well, she said, it was more than twenty years ago now. I had two friends. And I love them more than anything in the world. And they married each other. She paused, and I knew just in what way she had loved each of them. After they were married, I did not see much of them for a year or two. And then he wrote and asked me to come and stay, because his wife was ill, and I should cheer her up and cheer him up as well, for it was a gloomy house, and he himself was growing gloomy too. Well. I went. The address was in Lee, near London. The house didn't look gloomy. It was a smart new villa, with iron railings and a brightly coloured tiled front path. Well, they were very glad to see me, and I was very glad to be there. She went to bed early and asked me to keep him company through his last pipe. So we went into the dining room and sat in the two armchairs on each side of the fireplace. He sat looking into the fire. Presently, he said, "Margaret, this is a very peculiar house." He always called me Margaret. You see, we'd been such old friends. I told him I thought the house was very pretty, and fresh and homelike. He said, "It is new. That's just it. We're the first people who've ever lived in it. If it were an old house, I should think it was haunted." I asked if he had seen anything. No, he said, not yet. Heard then? Said I. No, not heard either. He said. But something follows me about. Only when I turn round, there's never anything. Only my shadow. And I always feel that I shall see the thing next minute, but I never do. Not quite. It's always just not visible. Has Mabel seen or heard anything? I asked. He shook his head. No, but I don't know when she may. And you know Mabel. 
She's like a little bird on a flower. You were always so sensible and strong-minded. I said yes, of course. Then he said he thought I could help him. And did I think anyone he had wronged could have laid a curse on him? And did I believe in curses? I said I didn't. And the only person anyone could have said he had wronged forgave him freely. I knew if there was anything to forgive. At first, when I began to notice things, I tried to think that it was his talk that had upset my nerves. It wasn't only at night, but in broad daylight, on the stairs, and in passages. The feeling used to be so awful that I had to bite my lips till they bled to keep myself from running upstairs at full speed. One night. I went down to the kitchen to heat some milk for Mabel. The servants had gone to bed. As I stood by the fire waiting for the milk to boil, I glanced through the open door and along the passage. There was a cupboard at the end of the passage, and the door was partly open. I said, "Mabel," but not because I thought it could be Mabel who was crouching down there, half in and half out of the cupboard. The thing was grey at first, and then it was black. Then it seemed to sink down till it lay like a pool of ink on the floor, and then its edges drew in, and it flowed into the cupboard till it was all gathered into the shadow there. I saw it go quite plainly. I screamed aloud, but even then, I'm thankful to say, I had enough sense to upset the boiling milk, so that when he came downstairs three steps at a time, I had the excuse for my scream of a scalded hand. The explanation satisfied Mabel, but next night he said, "Why didn't you tell me? It was that cupboard. All the horror of the house comes out of that. Tell me, have you seen anything yet, or is it only the nearly seeing and nearly hearing still?" I said, "Well, you must tell me first what you've seen." He told me, and what he had seen was what I had seen. After that, I hated to be alone with the shadow, because at any moment I might see something that would crouch and sink and lie like a black pool, and then slowly draw itself into the shadow that was nearest. Often that shadow was my own, and always I saw it with a straining of the eyes, as if my sight to see it had to be strained to the uttermost. And then, one morning, early. I heard it. It was close behind me, and it was only a sigh. It was worse than the thing that crept into the shadows. I couldn't have borne it if I hadn't been so fond of them both. But I knew in my heart that if he had no one to whom he could speak openly, he would go mad or tell Mabel. And the weeks went by. And Mabel's baby was born. The nurse and the doctor said that both mother and child were doing well. He and I sat late in the dining room that night. We had neither of us seen or heard anything for three days. Our anxiety about Mabel was lessened. We talked of the future. It seemed then so much brighter than the past. We arranged that the moment she was fit to be moved, he should take her away to the sea, and I should superintend the moving of their furniture into the new house he had already chosen. He was happier than I had seen him since his marriage, almost like his old self. When I said good night to him, he said a lot of things about my having been a comfort to them both. I hadn't done anything much, of course, but still. I am glad he said them. I went upstairs. As I passed Mabel's room, I listened at the door. Everything was quiet. I went on towards my own room, and in an instant, I felt that there was something behind me. I turned. It was crouching there. It sank. And as the black fluidness of it seemed to be sucked under the door of Mabel's room. I heard it sigh. I ran back, opened the door, and went in. The nurse and the baby were asleep. Mabel was asleep too. Oh, she looked so pretty, like a tired child. 
the baby was cuddled up into one of her arms, with its tiny head against her side. I prayed then that Mabel might never know the terrors that he and I had known, that her ears might never hear any but pretty sounds, those clear eyes never see any but pretty sights. I did not dare to pray for a long time after that, because my prayer was answered. Mabel never saw. Never heard anything more in this world. When they had put her in her coffin, I lighted wax candles round her, and I saw he had followed me. I took his hand to lead him away. At the door, we both turned. It seemed to us that we heard a sigh, and at that instant, we both saw it. Between us and the coffin, first grey, then black, it crouched an instant, then sank and liquefied, and was gathered together and drawn till it ran into the nearest shadow, and the nearest shadow was the shadow of Mabel's coffin. I left the next day. His mother came. She had never liked me. Miss Eastwich paused. I think she had quite forgotten us. Did you see him again? I whispered. Only once, Miss Eastwich answered, and something black crouched then between him and me. His second wife, crying beside his coffin. It's not a cheerful story, is it? I think it was seeing his daughter that brought it all back. She looked towards the dressing room door. The girl, I whispered, in there, is Mabel's baby. Yes, and she is exactly like Mabel, only with his eyes. Suddenly, Miss Eastwich leapt up, her eyes straining. She was looking at something that we could not see. That seemed not quite to reach the height of the dressing room door handle. Her eyes followed it down, down, widening and widening. Mine followed them, and did I quite see? I can't be certain, but we all heard the long-drawn, quivering sigh, followed by Miss Eastwich's dreadful, piercing cry as she caught up the candle. It dripped all over her trembling hand and staggered into the dressing room to the girl who had fainted during the dance, to Mabel's daughter. But it was too late. The doctor said that Mabel's daughter had died of heart disease, which she had inherited from her mother. It was that that had made her faint. But I have sometimes wondered whether she may not have inherited something from her father. I had never been able to forget the look on her dead face. The Shadow by E. Nesbit, abridged for radio by Roy Apps, was read by Anna Maidley and produced by Celia De Wolf. No one ever thought that May Forster would marry John Charrington, but he thought differently, and things which John Charrington intended had a queer way of coming to pass. He asked her to marry him before he went up to Oxford. She laughed and refused him. He asked her again next time he came home. Again she laughed, tossed her dainty blonde head, and again refused. The third time he asked her, she said it was becoming a confirmed bad habit, and laughed at him more than ever. John was not the only man who wanted to marry her. She was the belle of our village coterie, and we were all in love with her, more or less. It was a sort of fashion. Like masher collars or Inverness capes, therefore we were as much annoyed as surprised when John Charrington walked into our little local club. We held it in a loft over the Saddlers, I remember, and invited us all to his wedding. Your wedding. John Charrington filled his pipe 
and lighted it before he replied. Then he said, "I'm sorry to deprive you fellows of your only joke, but Miss Forster and I are to be married in September." You don't mean it? He's been jilted again and has turned his head. No, I said, rising. I see it's true. Lend me a pistol, someone, or a first-class fare to the other end of nowhere. Charrington has bewitched the only pretty girl in our twenty-mile radius. Was it mesmerism or love potion, Jack? Neither, sir. But a gift you'll never have: perseverance, and the best luck a man ever had in this world. There was something in his voice that silenced me, and all the chaff of the other fellows failed to draw him further. The queer thing about it was that when we congratulated Miss Forster, she blushed and smiled and dimpled, for all the world as though she were in love with him and had been in love with him all the time. Upon my word, I think she had. Women are strange creatures. We were all asked to the wedding, and I was to be best man. Does she care for him? I used to ask myself in the early days of their engagement. But after a certain evening in August. I never asked it again. I was coming home from the club through the churchyard. Our church is on a time-grown hill, and the turf about it is so thick and soft that one's footsteps are noiseless. I made no sound as I vaulted the low lichened wall and threaded my way between the tombstones. It was at the same instant that I heard John Charrington's voice and saw her. May was sitting on a low, flat gravestone with the full splendour of the western sun upon her mignon face. Its expression ended at once and for ever any question of love for him. It was transfigured to a beauty I should not have believed possible, even to that beautiful face. John lay at her feet, and it was his voice that broke the stillness of the golden August evening. My dear, I believe I should come back from the dead if you wanted me. I coughed at once to indicate my presence, and passed on into the shadow, fully enlightened. The wedding was to be early in September. Two days before, I had to run up to town on business. The train was late, of course. We are on the South Eastern, and as I stood grumbling with my watch in my hand, whom should I see but John Charrington and May Forster? They were walking up and down the unfrequented end of the platform, arm in arm, looking into each other's eyes, careless of the sympathetic interest of the porters. When the train eventually drew up at the platform, I passed the pair as I made my way to the first-class smoking carriage. "Hello, old man." John's voice was cheery as he swung his bag into my carriage. "Here's luck. I was expecting a dull journey." He shut the door and leaned out for a last word with his sweetheart. Oh, I wish you wouldn't go, John," she was saying, with a pleading intensity which would have sent my Gladstone onto the platform and me after it. But she wasn't speaking to me. John Charrington was made differently. He rarely changed his opinions, never his resolutions. I must, May. Old Brambridge has been awfully good to me," he answered, and we steamed out. After he had seen the last of the little figure on the platform. He leaned back in his corner and kept silence for a minute. When he spoke, it was to explain to me that he was both Mr. Brambridge's godson and sole heir. The old man lay dying and had sent for him, and he had felt bound to go. I shall be surely back tomorrow, he said, or if not, the day after, in heaps of time. And suppose Mr. Brambridge dies, alive or dead, I mean to be married on Thursday. John answered, lighting a cigar and unfolding the Times. John alighted at Peasmarsh Junction, while I went on to London, where I stayed the night. When I got home the next afternoon, a very wet one, by the way, my sister greeted me with, "Where's Mr. Charrington?" "Was he back?" I answered testily, for I had confidently expected to find him at home. "No, Geoffrey, he has not returned, and what is more, you may depend upon it, he won't. There'll be more wedding tomorrow than ever you'll take the first part in," I retorted. A prophecy which, by the way, came true. But though I could snarl confidently to my sister, I did not feel so comfortable when, late that night, standing on the doorstep of John's house, I heard he had not returned. I went home gloomily through the rain. 
Next morning brought a brilliant blue sky, gold sun, and all such softness of air and beauty of cloud as go to make up a perfect day. With my shaving water came a note from John. Mr. Brambridge had begged him so to stay another night that he had not the heart to refuse. I was to meet him at the station at three and come straight on to the church. I was at the station at half past two. I felt rather annoyed with John. It seemed a sort of slight to the beautiful girl who loved him, that he should come, as it were, out of breath and with the dust of travel upon him to take her hand, which some of us would have given the best years of our lives to take. But when the three o'clock train glided in and glided out again, having brought no passengers to our little station, I was more than annoyed. There was no other train for thirty five minutes. The three thirty five was late, of course. I ground my pipe between my teeth and stamped with impatience as I watched the signals. Click. The signal went down. Five minutes later, I flung myself into the carriage that I had brought for John. Drive to the church, I said. Mr. Charrington hasn't come. Anxiety now replaced anger. What had become of the man? Could he have been taken suddenly ill? I had never known him have a day's illness in his life, and even so, he might have telegraphed. Some awful accident must have happened to him. The thought that he had played her false never, no, not for a moment, entered my head. Something terrible had happened to him, and on me lay the task of telling his bride. It was five minutes to four as we drew up at the churchyard gate. A double row of eager onlookers lined the path from Lichgate to Porch. I sprang from the carriage and passed up between them. Our gardener had a good front place near the door. I stopped. Are they waiting still, Biles? I asked, simply to gain time, for of course I knew they were by the waiting crowd's attentive attitude. Waiting, sir? No, sir. Why? Must be over by now. Over? Then Mr. Charrington's come? To the minute, sir. Must have missed you somehow. And I say, sir, lowering his voice, I never see Mr. John the least bit so afore. But my opinion is, he's been drinking pretty free. His clothes was all dusty and his face like a sheet. I tell you, I didn't like the looks of him at all, and the folks inside are saying all sorts of things. You'll see. Something's gone very wrong with Mr. John, and he's tried liquor. He looked like a ghost, and in he went with his eyes straight before him with never a look or a word for none of us. Him, <laughs> there was always such a gentleman. As the bride and bridegroom came out, I saw that Biles was right. John Charrington did not look himself. There was dust on his coat, his hair was disarranged. He seemed to have been in some row, for there was a black mark above his eyebrow. He was deathly pale, but his pallor was not greater than that of the bride, who might have been carved in ivory. Dress, veil, orange blossoms, face, and all. As they passed out, the ringers stooped. There were six of them. And then, on the ears expecting the gay wedding peal, came the slow tolling of the passing bell. A thrill of horror at so foolish a jest from the ringers passed through us all. But the ringers themselves dropped the ropes and fled like rabbits out into the sunlight. The bride shuddered. And grey shadows came about her mouth, but the bridegroom led her on down the path where the people stood with the handfuls of rice. But the handfuls were never thrown, and the wedding bells never rang. In a hush, like the hush in the chamber of death, the bridal pair passed into their carriage, and its door slammed behind them. Then the tongues were loosed, a babel of anger, wonder, Conjecture from the guests and the spectators. If I had seen his condition, sir, said old Foster to me as we drove off, I would have stretched him on the floor of the church, sir, by heaven I would, before I'd have let him marry my daughter. He put his head out of the window. Drive like hell, he cried to the coachman. Don't spare the horses. He was obeyed. 
We passed the bride's carriage. I forbore to look at it, and old Forster turned his head away and swore. We reached home before it. We stood in the doorway in the blazing afternoon sun, and in about half a minute we heard wheels crunching the gravel. When the carriage stopped in front of the steps, old Forster and I ran down. I had the door open in a minute, and this is what I saw. No sign of John Charrington, and of May, his wife. Only a huddled heap of white satin lying half on the floor of the carriage, and half on the seat. I drove straight here, sir," said the coachman, as the bride's father lifted her out. And I'll swear no one got out of the carriage. We carried her into the house in her bridal dress and drew back her veil. I saw her face. Shall I ever forget it? White, white and drawn with agony and horror, bearing such a look of terror as I have never seen since, except in dreams, and her hair, her radiant blonde hair, I tell you, was white, like snow. As we stood, her father and I, half mad with the horror and mystery of it. A boy came up the avenue, a telegraph boy. They brought the orange envelope to me. I tore it open. Mister Charrington was thrown from the dog cart on his way to the station at half past one, killed on the spot. And he was married to May Forster in our parish church at half past three, in presence of half the parish. I shall be married, dead or alive. What had passed in that carriage on the homeward drive? No one knows. No one will ever know. Oh, May, my dear. Before a week was over, they laid her beside her husband in our little churchyard on the thyme-covered hill, the churchyard where they had kept their love trysts. Thus was accomplished, John Charrington's wedding. John Charrington's wedding by E. Nesbit was abridged for radio by Roy Apps and read by Tobias Menzies. It was produced by Celia Dewolf for BBC Radio Four Extra. It was a cold and wet November afternoon when I left London to go to Charleston on the Sussex Downs. I am a nurse by profession and had been engaged by Mr. Robert Eldridge to attend on his wife. It was, he had explained, a mental case. By the time the station fly dropped me off at the house, it was early evening. The wind drove the rain almost horizontally, but although the lights glowed from curtained windows, there was no other sign of life. I felt for the knocker and rapped smartly. A bolt ground back, a key turned, and framed in the doorway. Were two expectant but rather anxious faces, which I took to be those of my new employer and his wife. Come in, oh, come in," said Mrs. Eldridge. I went in, blinking at the light. Mr. Eldridge called a servant, and between them they carried my box upstairs. Mrs. Eldridge took my arm and led me into a low, square but homely room. In the lamplight. I turned to look at her. She was small and thin. Her hair, her face, and her hands were of the same tint of greyish yellow. Oh, I am so glad you've come," she said very softly. "I hope I shall be able to make you comfortable." She had a gentle, urgent way of speaking that was very winning. "I'm sure I shall be very comfortable," I said. "But it is I that am to take care of you. Have you been ill long?" It's not me that's ill, really," she said. "It's him." "I see," said I. "One must never contradict them. It only aggravates their disorder." "The reason," she was beginning, when his foot sounded on the stairs, and she fluttered off to get candles and hot water. He came in and shut the door. A fair, bearded, elderly man, quite ordinary. "You'll take care of her," he said. I don't want her to get talking to people. She fancies things. 
What form do the illusions take? I asked prosaically. She thinks I'm mad, he said, and she can't hear things that I can hear, see things that I can see, and she can't smell things. After I'd been in the house a few days, life at the farm started to come into focus, as strange surroundings do after a while. Mister and Missus Eldridge seemed to be very fond of each other, but they had a way of showing this fondness that told that they had known sorrow and had borne it together. Morning found them fairly cheerful, but after dinner, taken early, they seemed to grow more and more depressed. Just as dusk was falling, they always went for a walk together across the downs towards the sea. They invariably returned from this walk pale and dejected. Sometimes Mrs. Eldridge would cry afterwards alone in their bedroom, while he shut himself up in the little room they called the office. After supper, they always made an effort to be cheerful. But I observed in Mrs. Eldridge no sign of mental derangement, save in the persistent belief that her husband was deranged. I ought not to stay. I said to her one afternoon as we stood at the open door, "It was February now, and the snowdrops were thick in tufts beside the flagged path. You are quite well, both of you. I oughtn't to be taking your money and doing nothing for it. You're doing everything," she said. "You don't know how much you're doing." After a very long pause, she said very quietly and distinctly. He sees things that no one else sees, and hears things that no one else hears, and smells things that you can't smell if you're standing there beside him. I remembered with a sudden smile his words to me on the morning of my arrival: "She can't see or hear or smell." Her voice was so sane, so sweet. It came to me all of a sudden that I did not know to which of the two I owed my service. Have you any idea why? I asked her. She caught at my arm. Our daughter Bessie was killed by a motor. She said, "Of course, they said it was an accident. The motor was a violet colour. They go into mourning for queens with violet, don't they?" She added, "And my Bessie, she was a queen. So that was all right, wasn't it?" I told myself now that I saw that the woman was not normal, and I saw why. It was grief that had turned her brain. One evening. I was walking on the downs high above the English Channel. I struck a road that led quite unexpectedly into turf and furze bushes. Just as suddenly, I found myself at the cliff's edge, watching the sea pounding the rocks below me. I turned back, reaching first the road, and then a deep banked lane bordered with high hedges. It was her voice that I heard first. "No, no," she cried. "There's nothing." I tell you, yes," he replied. "Can't you hear it? That panting sound. Stand back, I tell you. It's close upon us." I came round the corner of the lane then, and as I came, I saw him catch her arm and throw her against the hedge, violently, as though the danger he feared were indeed close upon them. I stopped behind the turn of the hedge and stepped back. They had not seen me. Her eyes were on his face, and they held a world of pity, love, agony. His face was set in a mask of terror, and his eyes moved quickly as though they followed down the lane the swift passage of something that neither she nor I could see. Next moment, he was cowering, pressing his body into the hedge, his face hidden in his hands, and his whole body trembling. She had her arms round him. Come home, Robert," she said. "Come home. It's all your fancy. Come home with your wife that loves you." They went home. Later the next day, I asked her to come to my room to look at a new blouse I had bought. I told her what I had seen in the lane the evening before. She sat down in the chintz-covered armchair by the window, and broke into wild weeping. I stood by her, and soothed her as well as I could. It's a comfort to know," she said at last. "I haven't known what to believe. Many a time lately, I've wondered whether, after all, it could be me that was mad, like he said. It's the violet-coloured car he sees, the one that killed our Bessie. 
every day up there in the lane. He says he hears it and that he smells the petrol. And you can see he hears it and you can see he sees it. It haunts him as if it was a ghost. You see, it was he that picked her up after the car went over her. He saw her just as they had left her, lying in the dust. But there was a judgment on them. The very night of the funeral, that violet car went over the cliff, dashed to pieces every soul in it. There's my old man calling. Oh, poor old dear. He wants me to go out with him. She went, all in a hurry, and in her hurry, slipped on the stairs and twisted her ankle. It all happened in a minute, and it was a bad sprain. When I had bound it up, and she was on the sofa, she looked at him, standing as if he were undecided, staring out at the window with his cap in his hand, and then she looked at me. Mr. Eldridge, mustn't Mrs. Walk, she said. You go with him, my dear. A breath of air will do you good. As soon as we got outside the house, I tackled him. Tell me about the violet car. I said, full of that importance, that conscious competence that one feels in the presence of other people's troubles. He looked at me. I will tell you, by God, he said. I couldn't tell her, but I can tell you, without losing my soul more than it's lost already. The man that killed my girl was new down here, and he hadn't any eyes or ears, or he'd have known me, seeing we'd been face to face at the inquest. And you'd have thought he'd have stayed at home that one day, with the blinds drawn down. But not he. He was swirling and swivelling all about the country in his cursed car. The very time we were burying her. And at dusk, there was a mist coming up. He comes up behind me in this very lane. And I stood back. And he pulls up. And he calls out with his down lights full in my face. Can you tell me the way to Hexham, my man? says he. I didn't mean to do it. But before I knew anything, I'd said it. Straight ahead. Keep straight ahead. Then he was off. I ran after him to try to stop him. But what's the use of running after a car? And he kept straight on, down the lane, through the firs, and then right over the cliff. And every day since then... The car comes by, the car that nobody can see but me, and it keeps straight on. Mr. Eldridge, I said, you should go back home to be with your wife. She has a bad sprain. She needs you. No, he said earnestly. Somebody has to see that car every day as long as I live. Then I should be the one to see it tonight. No. He repeated, I'm the only person who deserves to see it. I argued with him, and I put all my will and all my energy into my persuasions until suddenly, like a door that you've been trying to open and that has resisted every key until the last one, he gave way. Yes, I should go to the lane, and he would go back home. I stood in the deepening dusk, looking up towards the downs and the sea. There were pale stars. Everything was very still. I turned to look back down the lane, only to see that he had not gone back home, but had followed me. He was standing a dozen yards away, with his face turned from me towards a violet car that was shooting up the lane. I crushed myself back into the crackling bare hedge. As the car neared him, he started back. Then suddenly he cried out, No! No more! No more! With that, he flung himself down on the road in front of the car, and its great tyres passed over him. I got to him and got his head up. He was dead. I went to a cottage where a labourer was having tea. He got some men and a hurdle. When I told his wife, the first intelligible thing she said was, It's better for him. Whatever he did, he's paid for now. So it looks as though she'd known, or guessed, more than he had thought. I stayed with her till her death. She did not live long. 
You think perhaps that the old man was knocked down and killed by a real motor, which happened to come that way of all ways at that hour of all hours, and happened to be of all colours. Violet. Well, a real motor leaves its mark on you where it kills you. But when I lifted up that old man's head from the road, there was no mark on him, no blood, no broken bones. His hair was not disordered, nor his dress. There was not even a speck of mud on him, except where he had touched the road in falling. There were no tire marks in the mud. The motor car that killed him came and went like a shadow. As he threw himself down, it swerved a little so that both its wheels should go over him. He died, the doctor said, of heart failure. I am the only person to know that he was killed by a violet car, which, having killed him, went noiselessly away towards the sea. What's more, there was no one in that car. It was just a violet car that moved along the lanes swiftly, silently. And empty. Charlotte Emerson reading *The Violet Car* by E. Nesbitt. It was abridged by Roy Apps and produced by Celia De Wolf. Laura and I were in Dimchurch on our honeymoon, when one day we walked out to Brenzit to see the church, and two fields from the church we found this pretty cottage covered in roses and jasmine. A long, low building with rooms sticking out in unexpected places. It was apparently the remains of a much bigger house that had once stood there. After a brief examination, we took it. It was absurdly cheap. The rest of our honeymoon we spent in grubbing about in second-hand shops, picking up bits of old oak and Chippendale chairs for our furnishing. After a run up to town and a visit to Liberty's, the low oak-beamed rooms began to be home. From the lattice windows, you could see the marsh pastures, and beyond them, the blue, thin line of the sea. We were as happy as the summer was glorious, and soon settled down into work. I used to paint in those days, and Laura used to write, and we felt sure we could keep the pot at least simmering. One October evening, I'd been down to smoke a pipe with the doctor, our only neighbour, a pleasant young Irishman by the name of Kelly. Laura had stayed at home to finish writing a comic sketch for a monthly magazine. I came in to find her sitting glumly at the kitchen table. Mrs. Dorman has just called round, she said. She says she's leaving us. Mrs. Dorman was the woman we had hired as our daily help. I frowned. Leaving us? Did she say why? Laura shook her head. But she said she's going on Thursday. Only three days' notice, I exclaimed. That's totally unreasonable. Laura sighed. If I have to cook the dinner, and you have to carry cans of water about and clean the boots and knives, we shall never have any time for work or earn any money or anything. I'll speak to Mrs. Dorman tomorrow. I said. I'm sure I can come to terms with her. It'll be all right. Now, why don't we take a walk up to the church? The church was a large and lonely one, and it looked at its best on that night. For the shadows of the yew trees fell through the windows upon the floor of the nave, and touched the pillars with tattered shade. On each side of the altar lay a grey marble figure of a knight in full plate armour, with hands held up in everlasting prayer. Their names were lost, but the local story was that they had been fierce and wicked men, marauders by land and sea, who had been the scourge of their time and had been guilty of deeds so foul that the house they had lived in, the big house that had stood on the site of our cottage. Had been stricken by lightning and the vengeance of heaven. But for all that, the gold of their heirs had bought them a place in the church. Looking at the bad, hard faces reproduced in the marble, this story was easily believed. The following morning, I spoke to Mrs. Dorman. I told her of our dismay that she was thinking of leaving us, and inquired if perhaps her wages weren't high enough. No, sir, she replied. I gets quite enough. It's, it's just that my niece is ill, <laughs> but your niece has been ill ever since we came. I might be able to come back next week. But why must you go this week? I persisted. Come out with it. Mrs. Dorman drew the little shawl which she always wore tightly across her bosom, as though she were cold. Then she said, with a sort of effort, 
Well, sir, she sank her voice. You, you may have seen in the church, beside the altar, two shapes. You mean the effigies of the knights in armour? I said cheerfully. I mean them two bodies, drawed out man size in marble. She returned, and I had to admit that her description was a thousand times more graphic than mine. To say nothing of a certain weird force and uncanniness about the phrase "drawed out man size in marble." They do say, as on All Saints' Eve, them two bodies sits up on their slabs, and gets off of them, and then walks down the aisle in their marble. Another good phrase, Mrs. Dorman. And as the church clock strikes eleven, they walks out of the church door. And over the graves, and if it's a wet night, there's the marks of their feet in the morning. And where do they go? I asked, rather fascinated. They comes back here to their home, sir. And I'm sorry to inconvenience you and your lady, but I must go on Thursday, Friday being All Saints' Eve. I did not tell Laura the legend of the shapes that walked in their marble, because I feared that a legend concerning our house might perhaps trouble her. Thursday passed off pretty well. Laura showed marked ability in the matter of steak and potatoes, and I confess that my knives and the plates which I insisted upon washing were better done than I had dared to expect. On Friday, Laura and I got up early. The housework was soon done, and we dined on cold steak and coffee. The walk we had that afternoon was, I think, the happiest time of all my life. When we had watched the deep scarlet clouds slowly pale into leaden grey against a pale green sky, and saw the white mists curl up along the hedgerows in the distant marsh, we came back to the house silently, hand in hand. Suddenly she said, "Jack, do you ever have presentiments of evil?" "No," I said, smiling, "and I shouldn't believe in them if I had." "I do," she went on. The night my father died, I knew it, though he was right away in the north of Scotland. I did not answer in words. She sat looking at the fire for some time in silence, gently stroking my hand. At last, she sprang up, came behind me, and drawing my head back, kissed me. "Come now," she said. "Light the candles, and we'll have some of these new Rubinstein duets." And we spent a happy hour or two at the piano. At about half past ten, I got up to go out for my good night pipe. Suddenly, Laura flung her arms round my neck and held me as if she would never let me go again. I stroked her hair. Eventually, she loosened her clasp a little and drew a deep breath. "Don't stay out too long," she whispered. "I won't, my dear." I strolled out of the front door, leaving it unlatched. What a night it was! There was a strange grey light over all the earth. The fields had that shadowy bloom over them, which only comes from the marriage of dew and moonshine, or frost and starlight. Across the meadows, I heard a bell beat from the church. Looking in at our low window, I saw Laura half lying on her chair in front of the fire. The night still held me, and I determined to go up to the church. I felt vaguely that it would be good to carry my love and thankfulness to that sanctuary, whither so many loads of sorrow and gladness had been borne. I reached the churchyard and passed through the corpse gate between the graves to the low porch. I paused for a moment on the stone seat where Laura and I had watched the fading landscape. Then I noticed that the door of the church was open, and I blamed myself for having left it unlatched the other night. I went in. It will seem strange, perhaps, that I should have gone halfway up the aisle before I remembered, with a sudden chill followed by as sudden a rush of self-contempt, that this was the very day and hour when, according to tradition, the shapes drawed out man size in marble began to walk. Having thus remembered the legend and remembered it with a shiver, of which I was ashamed, I could not do otherwise than walk up towards the altar just to look at the figures. To assure myself first that I did not believe the legend, and secondly that it was not true, I was rather glad that I had come. I thought now I could tell Mrs. Dorman how vain her fancies were, and how peacefully the marble figures slept on through the ghastly hour. In the grey dim light, the eastern end of the church looked larger than usual, and the arches above the two tombs looked larger too. And then the moon came out, and showed me the reason. 
I stopped short. My heart gave a leap that nearly choked me and then sank sickeningly. The bodies drawed out man size were gone, and their marble slabs lay wide and bare in the vague moonlight that slanted through the east window. Were they really gone? Or was I mad? Clenching my nerves, I stooped and passed my hand over the smooth slabs and felt their flat, unbroken surface. Horror seized me. I tore back along the aisle and out through the porch, biting my lips as I ran to keep myself from shrieking aloud. I leaped the churchyard wall and took the straight cut across the fields, led by the light from our windows. Just as I got over the first stile, a dark figure seemed to spring out of the ground. Mad still with that certainty of misfortune, I made for the thing that stood in my path, shouting, Get out of the way, can't you? But my push met with a more vigorous resistance than I had expected. My arms were caught just above the elbow and held as in a vice, and Kelly, my Irish doctor friend, actually shook me. Would ye? he cried. Would ye then? Let me go, I gasped. The, the, the marble figures in the church, they've gone. He broke into a ringing laugh. <laughs> ah, you've been smoking too much and listening to old wives' tales. I tell you, I've seen the bare slabs. <laughs> Have you now? Well, I tell you what, I'll walk back to the church with you and you can show me these bare slabs. You go, if you like, I said, a little less frantic for his laughter. I'm going home to my wife. Ah, rubbish man, said he. Do you think I'll permit her that? Are you to go saying all your life you've seen solid marble endowed with vitality, and me to go all my life saying you were a coward? The night air, a human voice, and I think also the physical contact with this six feet of solid common sense brought me back a little to my ordinary self, and the word coward was a mental shower bath. Come on then, I said sullenly. Perhaps you're right. Back in the church, all was still as death. The place smelt very damp and earthy. We walked up the aisle. I'm not ashamed to confess that I shut my eyes. I knew the figures would not be there. I heard Kelly strike a match. <laughs> ah, here they are, you see, right enough. Ah, you've been dreaming or drinking, asking your pardon for the imputation. I opened my eyes. By the light of Kelly's match I saw two shapes lying in their marble on their slabs. He was leaning over and looking at the right-hand figure, whose stony face was the most villainous and deadly in expression. By Jove, he said, something has been afoot here. This hand is broken. And so it was. I was certain that it had been perfect the last time Laura and I had been there. I was keen to get home, lest Laura should fret about my lateness. I invited Kelly back to take a drop of whiskey with me. We saw, as we walked up the garden path, that bright light streamed out of the front door, and presently saw that the parlour door was open too. It was all ablaze with candles, not only the wax ones, but at least a dozen guttering, glaring tallow dips, stuck in vases and ornaments in unlikely places. Light, I knew, was Laura's remedy for nervousness. We glanced round the room. The window was open, and the draught set all the candles flaring one way, her chair was empty, and her handkerchief and book lay on the floor. I turned to the window. There in the recess I saw her. She had fallen back across a table in the window, and her body lay half on it and half on the window seat, and her head hung down over the table, the brown hair loosened and fallen to the carpet. Her lips were drawn back, and her eyes wide, wide open. They saw nothing now. What had they seen last? I sprang to her, caught her in my arms, and cried, It's all right, Laura, I've got you safe. She fell into my arms in a heap. I clasped her and kissed her and called her by all her pet names. But I think I knew all the time that she was dead. Her hands were tightly clenched. In one of them she held something fast. When I was quite sure that she was dead and that nothing mattered at all any more, I let Kelly open her hand to see what she held. It was a grey marble finger. Man Size in Marble by E. Nesbitt, abridged by Roy Apps, was read by Harry Haddon Payton and produced by Celia de Wolf for BBC Radio 4 Extra.
When my aunt Dorcas died and left me seven hundred a year and a furnished house in Chelsea, I felt that life had nothing left to offer except immediate possession of the legacy. Even Mildred Mayhew, whom I had hitherto regarded as my life's light, became less luminous. I was not engaged to Mildred, but I lodged with her mother and gave her gloves when I could run to it, which was seldom. I meant to marry her some day. Before the gloss was off my new morning, I was seated in my aunt's armchair in front of the fire in the drawing room of my own house. The room was comfortably furnished with rosewood and damask. On the walls hung a few fairly good oil paintings, but the space above the mantelpiece was disfigured by an exceedingly bad print, the trial of Lord William Russell. The frame, though, beautifully and curiously carved in fine ebony, was as fine as the print was poor. Jane, my aunt's housemaid, who had come in with a lamp, noted my interest. Mistress only bought that picture two days before she was took ill, she said. But the frame she got out of the attic. There was a picture in it. That's upstairs too. But it's that black and ugly, it might as well be a chimney back. Directly after breakfast next morning, I paid a visit to the attic. After some searching, I found the picture as black as the chimney back. I took it downstairs carefully and examined it. Neither subject nor colour was distinguishable. It seemed to be painted on a very thick panel, bound with leather. But why? Then the truth dawned on me. I tore off the leather binding, and the panel divided and fell to the ground in a cloud of dust. There were two pictures. They had been nailed face to face. I studied the first one in some amazement, for it was of myself. A perfect portrait, no shade of expression or turn of feature wanting, but in the dress men wore when James I was king. When had this been done? And how? Without my knowledge, was there some whim of my aunt's? Law, sir, the shrill surprise of Jane at my elbow. What a lovely photograph. Was it took at the fancy dress ball, sir? Uh, yes, I stammered. Yes, that's right. Jane went, and I turned, still with my heart beating violently, to the other picture. This was a three-quarter length portrait of a woman in a black velvet gown. Her arms rested on a table beside her, her face was turned full forward, and her large, deep, luminous eyes met those of the spectator, bewilderingly. On the table by her were compasses and shining instruments, whose uses I did not know, books, a goblet, and a heap of papers and pens. But her eyes! I have never seen any other eyes like hers. They appealed as a child's do. They commanded, as might those of an empress. That evening when I was alone, I tore down the trial of Lord William Russell, and I put the picture of the woman in its strong ebony frame. I had another frame made for my portrait, and I hung it opposite the fireplace. I had invited Mildred and her mother to come and stay, and after a long day preparing for their visit, I sat down before the fire, and lying back in a pleasant languor, I idly looked up at the picture of the woman. I gazed into her dark, deep, hazel eyes, and felt my own dilate, pricked with a smart like the smart of tears. And then I saw the eyes of the picture dilate, and her lips tremble. I held out my arms. Her hands moved slightly, and a sort of flicker of a smile passed over her face. I sprang to my feet and looked at the picture. The ebony frame was empty. From the shadow of the worked chair came a soft rustle, and out of the shadow the woman of the picture was coming across the hearthrug towards me. Next moment a hand touched me. A hand soft, warm and human, and a low voice said, you called me. I am here.
At that touch and that voice, the world seemed to give a sort of bewildering half-turn. At once it seemed not awful, not even unusual, for portraits to become flesh. Only most natural, most right, most unspeakably fortunate. I laid my hand on hers. Those luminous eyes were looking up into mine. Those red lips were near me. With a passionate cry, a sense of having recovered life's one great good that had seemed wholly lost, I clasped her in my arms. I am wondering, she said after a while, when we had made such cheer each of the other as true lovers may after long parting, I am wondering how much you remember of our past. I, I remember nothing but that I love you, that I have loved you all my life. She leaned down towards me, her arm lay on my neck, and drew my head till it rested on her shoulder. I will tell you everything you have forgotten, she said, laughing softly, and her laughter stirred memories which I just grasped at and just missed. We loved each other. Ah, no, you have not forgotten that. And when you came back from the wars, we were to be married. Our pictures were painted before you went away, but then, because I had looked at the stars and gained more knowledge than other women, they must needs bind me to a stake and let me be eaten by the fire. And you, far away. And her whole body trembled and shrank. The night before they were to burn me, she went on, the devil came to me and I sold my soul to eternal flame. But my sin was for you. You see, the price I got was the right to come back to you through my picture as long as my picture stayed in its ebony frame. That frame was not carved by man's hand. My mother in her anguish had our pictures covered from sight. When you came home, they lied to you, and you married another woman. But some day I knew you would walk the world again and that I should find you, and through all these years your face was against mine. She paused. There was another gain, she said slowly, I gave my soul for. It is this. If you also will give up your hopes of heaven, as I gave up mine for you, I can remain a woman. I can remain in your world. I can be your wife. After all these years, at last. If I sacrifice my soul, I said, I win you. The words did not seem an imbecility, but she must have mistook the hesitation I may have felt in uttering them as some sort of doubt, for she said, Forgive me, it is such a thing to ask. No, I protested. Sacrificing my soul to win you? Why, it's a contradiction in terms. You are my soul. But she shook her head. I will return tomorrow night, she said. Twelve is a ghost's time, isn't it? And if you are decided then to give up your hopes of heaven, I shall live with you and die and be buried and there will be an end of me. But we shall live first and oh, how we shall live. I laid my head on her knee. A strange drowsiness overcame me. Holding her hand against my cheek, I lost consciousness. When I awoke, the grey November dawn was glimmering through the uncurtained window. My head was pillowed on my arm and rested not on my lady's knee, but on the needleworked cushion of the straight-backed chair. I turned my eyes on the picture. There she sat, my lady, my dear love. I held out my arms, but the passionate cry I would have uttered died on my lips. That afternoon, Mildred and her mother duly arrived for their stay. Although I received them with cordiality, my genial phrases all seemed to be someone else's. Still, Mildred and her mother managed to keep the conversational pot boiling with a profusion of genteel commonplaces. While I looked up at my sweetheart in the ebony frame. And then, Mildred, catching the direction of my gaze, looked at the portrait too and said, Doesn't she think a lot of herself? Suddenly she threw herself into the high-backed chair, 
covering the needlework with ridiculous flounces. Theatrical character, I suppose. Mildred. Sitting in the chair where my dear lady had sat when she told me her story, I could not bear it. Don't sit there, I said. It's, it's not comfortable. But Mildred would not be warned. With a laugh that set every nerve in my body vibrating with annoyance, she said, Oh dear, mustn't I even sit in the same chair as your black velvet woman? I looked at the chair in the picture. It was the same, and in her chair Mildred was sitting. I could not bear it. I hope you won't think me very rude, I said, rising, but I'm obliged to go out. I walked for hours along streets and squares. Mildred was utterly forgotten. My lady of the ebony frame filled my heart and soul and spirit. As I heard eleven boom through the fog, I turned and went home. When I got to my street, I found a crowd surging through it, a strong red light filling the air. The house was on fire. Mine! I elbowed my way through the crowd. As I sprang up the steps, I saw Mildred leaning out of the first floor window, wringing her hands. Come back, sir, cried a fireman. We'll get the young lady out right enough. But my lady... The stairs were crackling, smoking, and as hot as hell. As I reached the first floor, I felt arms about my neck. Save me, a voice whispered. I clasped a figure in my arms and bore it with a strange dis-ease down the shaking stairs and out into safety. It was Mildred. I knew that directly. I clasped her. Now, sir, everyone's safe. Please stand back ordered the fireman, taking my arm. I sprang from his hands and I leapt up the steps. As I crawled up the stairs, the whole horror came to me. As long as my picture remains in the ebony frame, what if picture and frame perish together? I fought with the fire and with my own choking inability to fight with it. As I reached the drawing room, I saw my lady through the smoke and the flames hold out her arms to me. But before I could reach her or cry out to her, I felt the floor yield beneath my feet, and I fell into the flames below. They saved me, somehow. Curse them. My friends pointed out that as the house and furniture were heavily insured, the carelessness of a housemaid had done me no harm. No harm. I had lost my only love. I deny with all my soul in the denial that it was a dream. There are no such dreams. Dreams of longing and pain there are in plenty, but dreams of complete, unspeakable happiness are ah, no. It is the rest of life that is the dream. But if I think that, why have I married Mildred and grown stout? and dull and prosperous, I tell you, it is all this that is the dream. My dear lady only is the reality. And what does it matter what one does in a dream? The Ebony Frame by E. Nesbitt was read by Anton Lesser and produced by Celia de Wolfe.